Okay, well, this morning we are going uh, to be looking, continuing our series in uh, what a healthy church looks like. And the next mark of a healthy church that we're going to focus on uh, today is uh, that of prayer. Uh, that a healthy church is a church that prays uh, individually and collectively. And uh, so as part of that, there was so many passages we could potentially turn to. But what I want to do this morning is focus in um, within the Sermon on the Mount and look at the section in there on prayer and see what Jesus himself teaches us um, about prayer. So we are going to uh, read from Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 6 and reading from verse 5 to the end of uh, verse 15. So Matthew chapter 6 at verse 5, and it says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace towards us. And Lord, as, as we have uh, been singing your praise, as we've heard your word uh, read, as we've taken up the offering, Lord, we do all these things as acts of worship to you. And Lord, we pray that you would now speak to us from your word, that by your Holy Spirit you would breathe faith in us that you would breathe life into us, Lord, so that the embers of our faith would uh, ignite and burn brightly and that our lives would be spent and used for your glory. Lord, so that you would take not only the offering that we have uplifted, but you would take every aspect of our lives, of our being, of our desires, of our hopes, that you would take every part of us and fill it with your light that we might give you glory and that we might find joy in you. So we ask that you would speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I was reading uh, this week and came across uh, a statement which was quite, uh, just put me in check, I guess. Uh, and it was this, the person said, if you doubt something, if you don't think it works, you don't use it. Um, if, if we doubt that something's going to be effective, um, if we don't think it's actually going to work, then we just stop using it. And you can think of that, uh, see that applied in the most basic of things. Just think around your house of things you've purchased or have been given and maybe at the time they seemed initially like a good idea, but you begin to wonder if they're actually effective and they now sit on a shelf. They're no longer the focus, they're no longer one of the key things that you turn to. But as I read that statement and I was thinking about preaching uh, this sermon today, it made me start to think about prayer. If we doubt prayer, if we don't think it works, then we don't do it. 
It loses its effectiveness for us. We think, what's the point in praying? So we have to ask ourselves, do we believe in prayer? Do we actually believe it works? Because the reality is that prayer is a mark of every true Christian. And therefore, it is a mark of a healthy church because a healthy church is one that is full of people who are following Jesus. And if we are truly following Jesus, the Bible tells us that we will be people of prayer. J.C. Ryle puts it this way. He says, God has no dumb children or no mute children. That every child of God is one who breathes Prayer, Just like every newborn baby begins life with that first gasp of breath and then continues to breathe for every moment of their life thereafter. And if you or I have no desire to pray, if you're sitting there just now and thinking, I just don't feel it, I have no desire to pray at all, then I would encourage you even now to turn that into a prayer, to gasp for breath now and ask God to do that in your heart, that you and I would have this hunger, this desire to pray. But I think one of the reasons we maybe doubt prayer sometimes, and one of the reasons we think we don't, uh, we don't think it works, is because we don't understand it. We don't really realize what the point of it is. So what I want us to do this morning is look at this passage, and I want to highlight five or six things to you about what Jesus teaches us about prayer and what he shows us about prayer. And hopefully as we see those, it will uh, ignite and fan into flame that desire to pray in our own hearts and also show us why it is so important for us to pray. So let me go through these. Some of these are, are very quick. We'll just take a minute or two on them. Others we might take a little bit longer. But the first thing that I want you to notice here is that it is not an issue of if you want to pray, but when. So it's about when and not if. And you can see that in verses 5 to 7. Notice he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. When you pray, go into your room. And when you pray, do not heap up empty words. This isn't something that you just do if you want to. This isn't something that is some kind of like on your phone, you know when you buy a phone or you buy a new car, there's optional upgrades, optional extras. Prayer isn't an optional upgrade for the Christians who really want to be super holy. Prayer is actually our way of breathing uh, and being in a communion, in in a relationship with God. So Jesus begins by saying, when you pray, not if you are going to pray. All followers of Christ are to pray. The second thing that I want you to see is that we are to pray to God and not to others. Notice in verses 5 and 6, he says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. He's saying, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be pretending to speak to God, but just showing off to others. In the, in the tradition, in the Jewish tradition from the Old Testament, the people were to pray two or three times a day at set times. And uh, therefore, they would, if they were close to the temple, the, the desire would be to be in the temple for that time of prayer because there were sacrifices being made and they would pray at the same time. But if not, they would try and stop and pray wherever they were so that they were praying at the same time as that offering was being made. And what Jesus is saying here isn't saying that uh, it's bad to pray in public. He's not saying that public prayer is wrong. But he's saying don't be pretending to speak to God and actually just doing it hoping that everybody else sees you and thinks you're really holy. And I guess the challenge for us is if the only times people ever or we ever pray is when there are other people around and we try and make them sound as eloquent as possible, then that tells us something about our hearts. Jesus is saying, you and I need to be remembering that prayer is a way of us speaking to God and not to those around us, not showing off to others. Because if all we are concerned about is our image before other people, 
then he's saying our words are empty. Our prayers are, are meaningless. It's like someone who comes in and flatters you in front of others when you know that they don't like you or that they're just doing it to impress other people. And it just rings empty and hollow. And notice he says, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. If, if all your, your prayer, if all your religion is just how other people see you, Jesus is saying, you got what you wanted. It's about your image to other people and they thought you're religious and that's it. But you've made no impression on God. You have no communion with God. So he says, when you pray then, pray to your Father in secret. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Like I said, he's not saying that corporate prayer is wrong or praying out loud in front of other people is wrong. Jesus did it himself. And uh, you see it all the way through the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've done it this morning where I've led you in prayer. But Jesus is saying, you and I need to have this heart of prayer where what we're really wanting, what we're really seeking after is to be in this relationship with God, this relationship of a child with their father. One of this genuine, intimate conversation of being in private with God where it doesn't matter who else is there. You're not trying to impress anyone else. You want to just have this conversation with him. And each of us know what that's like when you have a friend or a loved one, someone who's dear to you and life is busy. There's times where you want to just take that person and go aside and have a conversation, just the two of you. And Jesus is saying, pray like that. Not so other people can see it, not just trying to be good and, and as this kind of pretense, but have this relationship with God. Think about it, uh, an illustration maybe to help. If you, if you think of somebody who is, imagine a guy who is horrible to his family, just unloving and unkind to his wife and his kids. But every time they're in public, he puts on a great show of trying to be the perfect husband and the perfect dad. And it'll fool people for a while. But it never fools God and it never really fools his family. And... Jesus is saying, have this relationship with God, this one of sincerity and honesty, where when it's just you and him in the room, you speak to him openly as your father in heaven. Because your father in heaven sees what you do in secret as you come to him in prayer. And he will reward you. That private honesty before God is rewarded by him, not because you've earned it, right? Not because you've earned some right by praying in the right way and he's like, oh well, okay, I'm going to have to give you what you want. But because you've come and been honest before him as a child and expressed your love for him and your need for him and your weakness before him and as you do that, as you honestly come, he says he hears our prayers. That his ear is towards us and he hears those prayers that are poured out secretly and honestly before him. He calls us to seek him and promises to reward those who do seek him. So God is to be the focus of our prayers, not others. The third thing I want you to see is in verses 7 and 8 and that is that it's quality, not quantity that matters in prayer. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Right? In other words, you can't schmooze God. You can't win him by your patter or your flattery. It's not like by coming in and saying the right formula of words that you're going to win his favor. Or by coming in and flattering him with lots of really eloquent words. Right? You've read a, a couple of theology books or a, a, a thesaurus and you try and use the most flowery, poetic language you can. And, and by doing that, God's going to suddenly go like, oh, wow, yeah, that was a good prayer. No, he's not impressed by that. It's not the, the quantity of your words or the repetition of your words, but the, the quality, the sincerity, the honesty of your words before God. And this is why, you know, we're about to look at the, the Lord's Prayer just in a, in a couple minutes. But it's not some kind of magic mantra where if you make a mistake and then you say it five times, you wipe the slate clean. 
That's not how it works. It's not a case of repeating words to try and win his favor. No, he's saying, be honest before me. Don't try and impress me with your words. Do not be like them at all, because your Father in heaven already knows what you need before you even ask. So pray then like this. I know uh, somebody who, when they were a kid and they would realize they had done wrong, and I did this myself, I can't just say it was somebody else, but I also know somebody who was very good at this. They would do something wrong and they would see mum coming and then they would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they would say sorry and enough times that they would just try and drown out all other conversation just by repetition. Um, not necessarily by repentance, you know, but just wanting to try and drown out the noise by repeating themselves. And, and we don't want to be like that in prayer. Because like it says, don't be like them, for your father already knows what you need before you ask him. So if, <laughs> hopefully you're all just thinking the same thing as me as I read that, you think, well then why bother, right? Why is he asking us to pray if he already knows what we need. And this is where I think we get prayer so wrong, right? Because we think prayer is us just coming and asking God for things. And that's an element of it. Yes, of course, but that isn't what prayer is about because prayer uh, and, and the Christian life isn't primarily about us. It's about him. So prayer isn't about us just letting God know all the things that we want. Prayer is really intended for us to come and be in communion and relationship with God, to know him, to know his heart towards us. It's about this relationship with him. You know, like if, if you knew somebody who had a really powerful or wealthy parent, right? And then you discovered that their only relationship with him, the only time that they ever spoke to their parent was asking for stuff. Would you think that was a healthy relationship? You'd say, of course not. That's a terrible relationship. Right? They're only interested in getting things and not actually in being in this relationship. But I came across another story this week and it just blew me away as I, I heard it. So um, there was a, a Christmas film on this year, an animated thing, The Boy, The Horse, The Fox and The Mole or something like that. Maybe some of you saw it. It's like a kid's animation thing. The artist that did that is a Christian and a really gifted guy, but I heard, I saw a video of him speaking. His name's Charlie Mackesy. And he told this story that his friend is a vicar, right? And his friend was going in and out of hospital um, every week doing visits. And as he was walking through the ward and he was in his vicar's uh, collar or whatever, it was obvious he was a vicar. And he was walking past a bed and every time he walked past the bed, the man in the bed went like that. <laughs> Didn't say anything, just gave him the fingers. And the vicar walked past. And it happened every day, right? Day on day, until eventually the vicar would smile and the guy would, you know, and the vicar would just wave and give him a smile and keep going, right? And then one day, as he was going past, the man didn't give him the V's. He said, excuse me. So the vicar came over and he said, well, can I ask you a question? The vicar said, sure. He said, why? You know, like you're dressed up as a vicar. Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe what you believe? So the vicar just shared the gospel with him, told him about our sin and about God's love for us, about Christ coming, about how God has shown us mercy and grace and how he wants us to pray. And the man said, well, I don't know how to pray. How do you pray? And the vicar said, well, it's pretty simple. And he got out of the chair and he had the chair there next to the bed and he said, imagine that sitting in that chair is Jesus and his heart towards you is love. So what would you say to him if he was sitting there? And the man said, well, I think I'd have to admit I'm pretty scared. And the vicar said, that's good. It's good to be honest with him. What else would you say to him? And he said, well, I think I'd have to say I, I've really effed up my life big time. 
And the vicar said, that's good too, that's honest. And he promises that he loves us and he will forgive us as we do that. And so they had a conversation like that and he encouraged the man just to pray as if Jesus was sitting next to him because Jesus is next to him. So he left and that was it. And then a couple of days later he was in the hospital and he noticed that, um, noticed that the bed was empty. So he went and asked the nurse, oh, have you moved the guy that was in that bed? And the nurse said, no, I'm really sorry, he, he passed away. And uh, so the, the vicar said, I'm really sorry to hear that. And he was about to leave, and the nurse said, I probably, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but I just want to tell you that after you left, the guy was really excited the last time you saw him, and he kept talking about what you said about Jesus being in the chair. And, uh, and then when he died in, in the morning, we came in and found him, and he had got up and he was sitting on the edge of the bed and his head was on the seat of the chair and his arms were around the back of the chair and he was hugging the chair. And the, <laughs> I think the vicar probably called like I am right now, but just thought, the guy got it. right? The guy understood what prayer is because he realized that Jesus' heart towards him is love. And his heart towards you and me is love. And then we get annoyed because we've asked for something and we didn't get it. And we're in a huff. We don't want to speak to him. Or we're busy. Or we're just tired and we can't be bothered going out again. Or there's something more interesting on our phone right this minute. But he's sitting there and his heart towards you is love. Because prayer isn't primarily about us, but it's about him, about what he has done for us. So speak to God. Speak to the God who loves you and has made you to be in a relationship with him and has called you to call on him because his heart towards you is love. And he knows what you need. And he's saying, call on me. So it's not about the quantity of our words, but the quality and the honesty of our words. And then we come to the prayer itself that he teaches us, the, the Lord's Prayer. And we could spend hours, we could spend a sermon series on this, but we're not going to do that. And I want to just focus in on the fact that this prayer is primarily about God's will and not our will. It's about his will and not ours. Notice that it starts off, our Father in heaven. And just in that, in that opening line, we get this um, amazing picture of our relationship with him, right? He is in heaven and we are on earth. A huge <coughs> different distance, right? So separated, so far apart. But yet he is our Father and we are his children. So in that one expression, we have his holiness and his greatness and our humility and our, our lowliness, right? And our unworthiness. And at the same time, we are told, no, he is your father. His heart towards you is that of a father. Hallowed be your name, that we would um, lift his name up and sanctify, to hallow is to sanctify, to set apart something, right? Not because you're getting rid of it but to set it apart as special, that, that we would have God like that in our hearts, that we would set him apart from everything else, that uh, he would become the focus of every aspect of our lives, that, that he would become the light in which everything else is illuminated and shines. And that can only happen as we turn to him in prayer, right? If you're anything like me, then, then I feel that all the time. There's times where we feel like we are focused on him and then we are completely distracted and, and drawn into other things and we don't really care or are interested. But know that his name would be hallowed and just cover the whole of our lives and that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth. And this is a difficult prayer, isn't it? Like, are you, are, are you am, am I really willing to pray that? To ask God just now, your will be done. In the knowledge that as you say, 
Your will be done. You are laying down your own will. Right? It's hard enough for us to do that with one another. You're trying to decide what to have for dinner and you really want something and the other person wants something else. And you have to say, okay, it's okay, we'll have what you want. <laughs> right? That's a hard choice to make. Or which movie to watch or whatever, what to watch on TV or where to go on holiday, all these things. To lay down our will to somebody else's. But are we willing to do that with God and say, your will be done. And the amazing thing is that his will is one of love and goodness and it's perfect for us so it's no loss for us to say your will be done but it's a hard pray, prayer to pray as we see even Christ weeping in the garden as he says not my will but yours be done that we would pray that with joy even through the tears that we shed over our own will being set aside give us this day our daily bread because you and I need a whole lot less than we want, as we saw with our game with the kids. But we also need a whole lot more than we realize. So as we say, give us our daily bread, we're coming to him and saying, I want your will to happen in my life and give me what I need today. Which isn't going to be everything I want today. But give me what I need today. And give me all the stuff I need that I don't even realize that I need. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because we are, are sinners, not just, we don't just have an issue with the occasional sin, but we ourselves at the core of who we are as people, as humans, are sinners. And, and as we're redeemed, his blood covers that for us. But every single day we have to come to him and, and ask him for that grace, for that forgiveness. Because every single day we go astray. We never come into his presence on our own merit, right? We're never coming in self-justified and saying, God, I'm coming to pray today, but I have nailed it. Right? We come always because of his grace towards us. But as we receive that grace, we have to let go of the bitterness and the resentment that we have towards others. Right? Like a drowning person has to let go of the treasures that they're clinging on to in order to grab onto the life ring. And Jesus is saying, as you come to God and ask for forgiveness, you have to let go of that resentment and that bitterness towards others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Just acknowledging our weakness and our vulnerability, right? That temptation comes and no matter how strong we think we are, it can just blindside us, right? However good your day is. Something can tick you off and it just, you go down off to a dark place, right? And we are asking him, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from that evil. And in this prayer, in, in all of those petitions, we see this desire for what God wants in our lives and not what we want in our sinful nature. So our prayer needs to be marked by this desire to seek his will and not our own. And then, uh, fifthly, we see that it's practice, not theory. Right? So if we're praying stuff and then not living it out, it's pretty empty. We have to come and speak to God and be open and honest to him. But then we need to go and live it out. And you see that in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. He's unpacking verse 12, eh, where uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You and I are saved by grace alone, yeah? It's because of his grace towards us that we are saved. But that saving grace is never all alone. <laughs> We're saved by grace alone, but it doesn't mean that we sit around and have nothing to do. We need to respond to that grace with faith. He offers us that grace and we have to believe in him and trust in him. And he offers us, but we need to respond to that forgiveness offered to us with uh, forgiving others. And this is hard, right? This is hard just 
on the most basic level. When people tick you off and annoy you. Never mind heartbreaking pain that others have caused you. But Jesus says, come and ask for forgiveness. And as you do that, lay down that bitterness and that resentment or that hurt, that heartache at his feet also. And allow him to deal with it. And it doesn't mean that you don't seek justice, right? He, the Psalms and, and repeatedly we are called to, to pray for justice. But not to seek vengeance ourselves, but to come and be Christ-like as we come to him. And you and I are only ever going to manage that through prayer, aren't we? We can't do that on our own. And the reality is that that bitterness that we can hold towards other people, that lack of forgiveness becomes really ugly, especially if it's dragged out into the light. There was a song I came across this week by, uh, I had never heard of her before, Isabel Pless, um, but it's called Spam Calls, the song, and, and she's talking about how, I'm assuming it's her boyfriend or whatever, her ex-boyfriend has hurt her, and it's how she feels when she sees him, right? But the, some of the lines from the song, it says, it sucks to see that you're doing okay. I hope your happiness is a passing face because I want to be the one who moves on and rubs it in your face. And it's, a, it's like a cool sounding folk song. It's like really gentle and la la la. But um, there's this bitterness and this resentment in it, right? And yeah, she's been really honest. As she sings it, we have to, it resonates and it's, it's popular because people listen to it and they're like, that's how I feel. But Jesus is saying as we, as we come to God in prayer and as we seek his forgiveness because we have offended him, then we need to be like Christ and live that out. So finally, in conclusion, you and I, if we are to follow Christ, need to be people of prayer. Not prayer just formally in front of other people, but prayer that is in the secret place that our hearts would constantly breathe in and breathe out in communion with God, in a relationship with Him. Where we are constantly looking to Him and seeking His will in our lives. Not trying to impress Him with the quantity of our words, but by laying our hearts open honestly before Him. That uh, from the very beginning in our call to worship this morning, we saw God saying he had created us and made us to be in this relationship where we call on him. And he promises us that as we do that, he will bless us. So let us be people who grow in prayer, that we would grow in that relationship with God. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 6. He says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And then he goes on and asks for them to pray for him also, as he does it. Right? That we need to just constantly be in this communication, in this relationship with God. And we do this because Jesus has instructed us, because he has given us this example, because even now he himself prays for us. In Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's be people who are marked by prayer, by this desire to be in a communication, in a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray to him now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, even as we come before you now, that you pray on our behalf. And Lord, so often we don't even know what to say. But Lord, we want to be in a relationship with you. Lord, we know because your light, the, the light of your word has shown us, we know that we're sinners. We know that we uh, fall short. Lord, we disappoint ourselves. 
never mind others or you. But yet your heart towards us is one of love, that you are gentle and lowly and that you care for us, that you love us. Forgive us for being huffy. Forgive us for not speaking to you because we haven't got what we want. And instead, help us to be drawn to you by your love, that we would become more and more like you, and that you would help us to lift everything up to you and surrender it to your will, knowing that your will for us is good. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. This evening at, at 6 p.m. we'll gather here again, uh, and we're going to this evening look at three stories that Jesus told uh, that helped us uh, illustrate prayer and how we are to pray. So I'd really encourage you, if you are able to, it'd be great if you're able to join us for that. But now let's have the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.